everyone and welcome back to my channel. Heather Stamper here and today is the book talk day for the month of July. Wow, I have been busy. I finally finished some of the big tomes and started on some new tomes and I've got all different types today. So let's get this thing going, okay? So the first book I read this month was Juneteenth by Ralph Ellison. And it's a book that has a secret in it for those of you following the Pop Sugar Reading Challenge. When Senator Adam Sunrader gets shot on the Senate floor, he asks for an itinerant preacher he calls Daddy Hickman to tell him what happened while there is still time. Thus begins the story of Sunrader, who was known as Bliss as a young child. He was an orphan who was taken in by Hickman, and he was raised to be a preacher. And it's told partly through uh, Hickman's point of view, which is wonderfully lyrical and full of uh, jazz tempo and, you know, that old time revival type preaching. And from Sun Raider's death dreaming, you know, very sporadic, which made the book a little hard to read. I had to go back. I had to listen and read at the same time to make sure that I understood all of the things that was going on with this book. It's a story of love, rejection, faith, uh, racism interwoven with the secrets of its origin and the mystery of how a promising child minister in an African-American community grows up to abandon everything about his existence uh, in the pursuit of fame and glory. Some readers out there may not understand the concept or the controversy of what was known as passing, where if you had African-American uh, people who were very light-skinned uh, or mixed, they would you know, pass themselves off as white to gain the advantages of society at that time. And while well, some people would say, well, you know, you got to take the breaks where you can get them. They also had to give up everything about their community. They had to basically disown their family, th where they came from and their heritage in order to take advantage of, you know, the white privileges, which even it sounds even icky coming out of my mouth right now. So, so anyway, it deals with that controversy as well. Four bookmarks. I would have given it five, but it was kind of a heavier, harder read for me between the point of view changes and just the way the fever dream, the death dreaming was going on. So that's why four instead of five bookmarks. D, Tale of Two Worlds. And this one given uh, an endorsement by a favorite author of mine, Neil Gaiman. Tequila woke up one morning. And the letter D disappeared from all of uh, people's speech. So dogs were ogs, daffodils were affidils, difficulty was difficulty. And then it was weird and irritating, but you know, she figured it was a phase and people would, you know, get over the joke or whatever. But then the actual D things started to disappear. So dogs, donkeys, um, daffodils, they, they just disappeared. In the middle of all this, she gets summoned to the home of her old history teacher, Professor Dodderfield. And he discovered where the D's were going, then where they were being taken. And so she's sent on her hero's journey to the alternative land of Limnus, where it's always winter and it's being controlled by the Gamp, who has bullied all the creatures in the land. And some have been so brainwashed that they uh, think that he's actually a good guy. I don't know what they could be referencing at all. It gives, it reminds me of, you know, like Lion Witch in the Wardrobe. It also reminds me a bit of Alice in Wonderland. And her companion on this journey is the professor's Labrador, Labrador retriever, uh, Nellie Robinson, who's actually a shape shifting sphinx. Because why not? It makes for a great story. So it's up to Dequilo and Nellie to bring the D's back to England. And it's it's a very fun story. You know, I read it with my husband and we had many, many a chuckle just reading it out loud, trying to keep the D's out that we wanted to keep putting them back in. But it's a story of courage and overcoming challenges and, you know, the concept of free thinking societies. 
So very cleverly done. I give this one four bookmarks as well. A Year of Wonders by Geraldine Brooks. It's based on the true story of the little village of Eam, which was the plague village uh, in England in 1666. Uh, and it's told from the point of view of Anna Frith, uh, the rector's maid. Anna is a young wi widow who is just trying to make ends meet and for herself and for her two toddler sons. Her husband died in, in a mining accident. And, you know, so she works at uh, jobs at the rector's house, uh, Reverend Michael Montpellion and his wife, Eleanor, you know, she do, does odd jobs for, you know, other upper class people in the village. And she rents her room out at her house for, for travelers. Here comes the plague. So we have this very fine looking tailor named Mr. Vickers that came from London, brought his cloth from London where the plague was at, he gets sick and dies in her house and people have bought the cloth that he brought with. Don't know what could possibly go wrong with this one, right? Okay, so from there, her two sons get sick and die. Her neighbors have people who, you know, get sick and die. And it just starts devastating the village for the whole year. Now, Reverend Montpellier convinces the village to close its gates and isolate and live in quarantine for an entire year in hopes to contain the, the, the disease. He has friends outside the village that would leave supplies on a rock, you know, so that they didn't get sick. And then they would come later and retrieve the items so that, you know, people could still eat and, and get whatever medicines that they could. What follows inside that village in, during that year of quarantine is a hot, hot mess. It's a year of trickery and betrayal and death and science and religion and learning and love and lust and witch hunts and herbalism. And in the end, it results in the loss of one third of the population of the village. Anna's story is one of self-discovery and learning and bravery and resilience in the face of these really ridiculous times. So this was one of the books that was on the banned book list. It was like number 100 in the top 100 books that were banned or challenged in the last 10 years. And I really couldn't find a reason why that was listed. So I can only assume that because of a strong and flawed female protagonist uh, who questions the church, how very dare, and their sexuality and some drug use because, you know, they had to do some experimentations in order to get the best uh, possible outcomes. And, you know, science back then was a lot of trial and error. So I thought it was very good, though. And four bookmarks, totally, totally worth it. So the next book I read was The Four Tendencies by Gretchen Rubin. As I've shown in some of my other videos, I'm doing some of her strategies to increase my happiness level and just learn a little more about myself. So it's a self-help personal development book about responding to expectations. Depending on the response, you know, how do you, what do you think of your outside expectations and how do you respond to your inner expectations? Basically, Gretchen Rubin, you know, was able to categorize people into four things. Upholders who have high meet outside expectations and inside expectations, inner expectations. You have the questioners who question the outer expectations, but honor their inner expectations. The obligers who honor external expectations, but at the cost of their internal expectations. And the rebels who don't like expectations and are outer and they will do what they want when they want. I don't know anybody like that, do you? I can I can think of people that fit in all four of those categories, to be honest. And I'm sure most of you could too. In the book, it outlines the strengths and challenges um, and for decision making with and with dealing with people regardless of what their tendency is. And strategies are given ranging from organization strategies to wording and framing for when you are speaking and making requests of other people, or even just setting that mindset for yourself. I'm an obliger. And that means that I'm more concerned about how I'm going to disappoint other people than I am about disappointing myself. So if I put 
a personal expectation on myself about you know working out more i need to have a frame of accountability that's not just myself so that i can be more successful very good i found it very helpful uh four bookmarks if that's something that interests you by all means please go read it and check out our podcast The next book featured a party in the Pop Sugar Reading Challenge, The Decameron. This was the last of my ginormous tomes that I was reading during the spring. And it's by Giovanni Boccaccio. It was written in the 1300s, mid-1300s, again, around plague time. Okay, so a group of nobles uh, are vacationing at a little country villa outside of Florence. They're trying to ride out the and recover from the their plague year in the 1300s. And so the men and women devise a little entertainment strategy where one person is the king or queen and names a topic and everybody else has to come up with a story at lunchtime to entertain everybody else. Well, this sounds like a first world problem type of thing. It's like, uh, gee, you know, people are dying and, and stuff. You know, it's like, it was also a way to keep morale up during those times. So 10 days, 10 stories a day, because there's 10 people, 100. Decameron equals 100 Latin. Yeah. (laughs) So the topics range from love to vengeance to, you know, spiritual to, you know, all sorts. It runs the gamut of the things that were of concerns at their time. And some of the some of the stories are serious. Some don't age very well, as to be expected when it was written that far back in the past. It's socially acceptable to, you know, to beat your spouse and, and things like that. No, 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 no. Um, some are body. Uh, some have like mad singers. Uh, and most of them poke fun at politics and religions and status at the time. So I found it to be very witty. I would listen to it in segments because It's over 900 pages long. If you're the type that looked for the biggest book possible, this is one of them. Okay. Four bookmarks for the Decameron. The next book that I read had cutlery on the cover, either in words or in the picture for the Pop Sugar Reading Challenge, Egg and Spoon by Gregory Maguire. So think Prince and the Pauper, set in the turn of the 20th century Russia, Throw in some legendary Russian folklore characters, and it's pretty much this book. The story of a girl named Elena, who is an impoverished peasant, left to care for her ailing mother after her father died, and her brothers have been conscripted into the army. So when the train is stalled outside of her little village due to a washed out village, more on that later, Elena meets Ekaterina, a schoolgirl, um, from the nobility who's on her way to see the czar. She was invited to the czar's godson's birthday party extravaganza, which is also a a wife hunting, betrothal hunting opportunity. Let the shenanigans begin. We've got mistaken identity, a firebird egg, first world problems, an imperial ball, a Fabergé egg, Baba Yaga, global warming, an ice dragon, a prince in disguise, and gee, I don't know if there's enough thing. I'd say uh, the best part of the book was Baba Yaga uh, and her snarky one-liners and her conversations with her uh, her cat Muster. The pace was really slow and a bit overstuffed for a middle grade novel, which is basically what it is. It was classified as YA, but it doesn't have the YA angst that you would attribute it. It's YA because of length. We're talking about nearly 500 pages here, guys. That is way too long for a middle grade book. The other thing that I didn't care for in this book was the narrator insertions. It's an imprisoned monk. It doesn't really add anything to the narrative. It doesn't add to the commentary of the times for me. And you could have taken that part out, cut back about 50 to 75 pages of the stuff that he had to input, and you'd still have a great story. Now, Gregory Maguire is the author who did the Wicked book uh, and and the Oz books. And there's, it's kind of hit and miss for me with with his stuff. It's either really brilliantly awesome or it's 
awkward. And this fell more in the awkward category for me. So I give it three bookmarks, basically because of the Baba Yaga um, interchanges, which were freaking hilarious. So yeah, there you have it. Those are my books that I read through for the month of July. Uh, let me know what you think. If you've read any of these books or if you had any interest in these books, you know, please put comments below. Maybe I missed a clue in some of them that is like, oh yeah, that would have helped if I, you know, clicked in on that. If you like these types of videos, please click like and subscribe and dangling the notification bell. And I will see you in the next video. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.